Good evening. I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, co-director of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this event with the artist Michael Rakowitz, who will be in conversation with Sean Burris, Andrew W. Mellon, postdoctoral curatorial fellow at the BCMA, and Sarah Graff, associate curator in the Department of Ancient Near Eastern Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In 2019, Burris and Graff launched a collaborative project, Northwest by Northeast, exploring the intersecting histories of ancient Assyrian reliefs like those at Bowdoin. From the Northwest Palace of King Ashurnasir Paul II, collected in the second half of the 19th century by several museums in the Northeastern United States. The artist himself is deeply interested in the history of this palace complex created roughly 3000 years ago, which occupies an important place in his work today. Our event this evening focuses on Rakowitz's The Ballad of Special Ops Cody of 2017, which the artist will introduce. As viewers will observe, the 14 minute stop action video testifies to the intimate connection between the ancient past and the present and raises compelling questions about what it means to collect, protect and interpret cultural artifacts. Perhaps most important, can we identify with the humanity these objects represent? In many ways, this question lies at the heart of Rakowitz's artistic practice, which has spanned numerous media and encompassed many forms, from sculpture to animation to architecture to food. A professor of art theory and practice at Northwestern University, Rakowitz has been widely recognized and his work has been exhibited and collected around the world. His awards include the 2020 Nasher Prize for Sculpture, the Herb Alpert Award in Visual Art, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Biennial Award, and a Creative Capital Grant. Between 2018 and 2020, a sculpture by Rakowitz was featured in the prestigious Fourth Plinth series in London's Trafalgar Square. Rakowitz's work is now on view at the BCMA in Assyria to America, curated by Sean Burris and Jim Higginbotham, Associate Professor of Classics on the Henry Johnson Professorship Fund and curator for the ancient collection. The show, which examines the ancient and modern histories of Bowdoin's six Assyrian reliefs from ancient Nimrud outside present day Mosul, Iraq, will remain on view until January 30th, 2022. We encourage everyone taking part in this evening's program to see it. However, while the museum remains closed to the public due to the pandemic, we hope you will enjoy the recently launched virtual version of the show available through the museum's website. It's a pleasure to welcome Michael Rakowitz and Sarah Graff to Bowdoin virtually. I now turn the floor to Sean Burris, who will further frame this evening's discussion. Thank you. Sean? Thank you, Anne. It's a real treat to be joined this evening by two friends, fellow students, and tireless advocates of ancient Mesopotamian and contemporary Iraqi culture for this film screening and for what promises to be a deeply thought-provoking and wide-ranging conversation following. I'll keep my introduction brief because I'm eager to get to the heart of this program and to share Michael's work with you and to reflect together on the complex and challenging issues his art engages, questions of cultural heritage, memory and loss, and the intertwined human and material tolls of decades of devastation and conflict in the Middle East. Our campus community and visitors to the Bowdoin College Museum of Art will already be familiar with Michael's work. His colorfully modern sculptures and recreations of ancient Mesopotamian artifacts have been on display in the exhibition Assyria to America, which opened last fall. 
Michael is a contemporary artist of Iraqi Jewish descent working in Chicago and a professor of art at Northwestern. His conceptual projects, sculptures, and public art installations prompt us to think very critically about issues of cultural heritage and connections between past and present in the Middle East. Michael's work has been featured in ma major exhibitions at MoMA, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the British Museum, the Palais de Tokyo, and the Museum of Con Contemporary Art in Chicago, and the Whitechapel Gallery in London, among many others. From 2018 to this summer, Michael's sculpture of an Assyrian Lamassu occupied the fourth plank in London's Trafalgar Square. And earlier this year, Michael received the Nasher Prize for Excellence in Contemporary Sculpture. Joining me also is my colleague, Sarah Graff, an associate curator in the Department of Ancient Near Eastern Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. A graduate of the Institute of Fine Arts, Sarah's research has dealt with the visual and material aspects of myth and magic in ancient Mesopotamia. In addition to her many contributions to major exhibitions at the Met, in recent years, Sarah has developed a very successful series of gallery talks called Met Perspectives, which engage contemporary issues like migration and conflict through visitor tours in the Met's galleries. Over the past two years, Sarah and I have worked together to lead the Northwest by Northeast Project, a digital collaborative aimed at virtually reconnecting, restoring, and recontextualizing the palace reliefs from ancient Nimrud that are found today in museum collections across the globe. This evening, Michael will introduce and screen his 2017 stop-motion film, The Ballad of Special Ops Cody, which was on view at the museum this past spring. Following the screening, Sarah and I will join Michael in a discussion of the film and of his practice as a contemporary artist before inviting questions from the audience. Let me just say at the outset, Michael and Sarah, how delighted I am to be able to welcome you both to Bowdoin virtually, and how grateful we are that you could join us this evening. Michael, I'll turn the stage over to you. Sean, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, for this 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 wonderful invitation to to engage with you. And uh, Sarah, it's really terrific to to have met you through this process and to know of your work and um, and to be able to to speak with you as well. And to everyone at Bowdoin who made this possible, um, my deepest gratitude and uh, my greetings to the students and to the entire community. Um, so, in in by way of introduction, I think what I will do is um, is to share my screen if it's possible. I need to actually be given uh, privileges for that from our host. Um, and I'll walk through the kind of larger project of the invisible enemy should not exist, um, which is this ongoing work that Sean alluded to, wherein my uh, my studio uh, reappears the artifacts that were looted from um, the National Museum of Iraq. Uh, during the US-led invasion or have been destroyed in its aftermath by groups like ISIS. And so uh, what we'll start with here is these images that I received um, in 2003 of an emptied out museum. These are images of the National Museum of Iraq after it was looted from April 9th until the 10th of 2003. In 2006, I came across a database at the University of Chicago that was called the Lost Treasures from Iraq database. They had gone live with this, um, this archive that basically served two purposes. One was to educate the global um, population on just how much human cultural heritage had been uh, essentially lost in the wake of this war. And the other was to deter um, people who collect Mesopotamian artifacts on the black or the gray market 
um, from buying anything that looked anything like these artifacts. And for me, it became a database through which to imagine these artifacts that are now for all intents and purposes invisible um, to make them visible again, to make them reappear as a kind of spectral presence. And the material that I chose to do this was actually the Middle Eastern food wrappers and the Arabic English newspapers, both of which one finds in Middle Eastern groceries across the United States where there are Arab populations. <clears throat> My reason for doing this, <clears throat> excuse me, was because a larger um, kind of concern in my practice has always been about um, the transmission of cultural heritage that exists in things that are not just votive sculptures, but in traditions. And cooking is one of them. And I became intrigued by the fact that these green mamul cookies that one sees on this figure that's recreated here are actually um, made with dates that come from Iraq. The packages don't say that because of the UN sanctions that were um, that were adopted in 1990 until 2003. And so they say Saudi dates, but everybody knows they're actually from Iraq. And so it becomes this veiled provenance and provenance is what gives an archeological archeolo artifact its value. Um, and so in order to kind of um, make something that wasn't simply a one-to-one -one ratio, I wanted to work with the um, the context of these objects that were going to be made out of the provenance of something that was too terrified to tell me where it was from, that it was almost like xenophobia had been visited on the object and it was not able to tell me its origins out of fear. And so this is an ongoing project uh, wherein my, my assistants and I have been um, you know, slowly moving through this archive of more than fifteen, uh, more than eight thousand artifacts that are still listed as missing, stolen, or status unknown. But now, as Sean uh, said in his introduction, is included um, artifacts like the colossal Lamassu that was destroyed at the Nurgle Gate of Nineveh in 2015 by ISIS and the entire palace of, the, of uh, the, the entire Northwest Palace of Nimrud, which held um, reliefs, uh, one of which you can see my studio and I are making behind me. Um, and so it's a project that will clearly outlive me and my studio. If we go back to these votive statues, one thing that's interesting about them is that there's an archeological theory that these were carried by worshipers who would go to the Akitu or the temple and with their hands clasped in prayer it was supposed to mimic the worshiper. And the idea was that you would leave that statue there at the temple and that it was a surrogate for you. Um, and that it would continue praying after you've left and that you would still receive the blessings even after you left the temple. Um, I was really intrigued with these objects, obviously being placeholders for the lost Iraqi lives, you know, that were not given the same level of outrage as the lost objects that were looted from the museums. Um, but when I thought about these, uh, these sculptures themselves having a kind of agency, it, it, it was something that would return um, in a project called The Ballad of Special Ops Cody, um, which uh, we'll be talking about today. Um, this is uh, a, a hoard of these votive sculptures that one finds here at the University of Chicago. Um, and uh, here they are in their vitrine. And um, at the Oriental Institute, this has been one of the places that I've gone to and, and, and I've stood in front of and seen it almost like a family portrait of these objects uh, looking back at me that are in one way or another kind of an ancestor. I started to think about what these sculptures had to say. And what prompted me to think about what they had to say was another votive sculpture, another uh, votive 
uh, which came out of this story. So this photograph um, was released by the Mujahideen squadrons and Iraqi insurgent group in early 2005. And, um, and it was said to show the uh, a US soldier named uh, John Adam, who was being held by the insurgent group. And they said that they were going to behead him within 72 hours, unless all uh, Iraqi prisoners that were being held in US jails um, in Iraq and in Kuwait and in Saudi Arabia were, if they weren't free, they were going to behead him. And, um, and so for about 24 hours, the U.S. military scrambled to find a John Adam in their ranks and they couldn't find one. And then a company called Dragon Models, uh, looked at the photo carefully and realized that it was not um, an actual soldier, but a doll that was called Special Ops Cody. And these dolls were available for purchase on uh, US bases um, throughout the Middle East, uh, throughout Iraq and throughout Kuwait. And they were available in all different uh, genders and ethnicities, and uh, a soldier would um, find the one that looks like them and send it back to their kids back home um, as a kind of surrogate for a deployed parent or an uncle or a brother. And I immediately started to think about these dolls as a kind of votive. And in 2008, I was able to track down the last doll that was part of this hoax. Um, the one, the exact one that's featured in, in the photo um, or is the exact same type. And I held on to it um, from 2008 until 2017, you know, waiting for it to tell me what it wanted to do, what it wanted to be. And I believe that when you sit with an object or material long enough, it tells you about itself and what it wants to be. And so I started to think what would a votive sculpture, you know, from 2005 AD say to a votive sculpture from 2005 BC. And the idea was to have uh, Special Ops Cody essentially enter the vitrines of the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago and to engage with them. How they would engage, I wasn't entirely sure because how could I speak for Special Ops Cody? And what would I know about what it was that, that one doll would say to another? And then I met a wonderful artist named Jin McGill Prather, who is an Iraq war veteran who served as a medic at Camp Buka in Iraq and has become an active member of warrior writers who are a group of, of soldiers who have returned from various conflicts, including the Iraq war and, um, and Afghanistan, and have essentially engaged with the act of writing as a way of piecing together memories that have been shattered by trauma and also engaging in a kind of parisia or truth telling. And um, Jin was particularly interested in this project once I told her the story of this doll. And she mentioned to me that around this time, she had been given the, um, the kind of unfathomable duty of identifying four unrecognizable bodies of Iraqi detainees that had been killed in a, a prison uprising. Um, a, a, an uprising against their American captors. And um, according to Jin, many of their defining uh, traits like their eyes had been gouged out and, um, and there, were, there were few identifying um, features. And so she had to do what the people in admin were too squeamish to do. And so as she looked at the sculptures in the vitrines of the Oriental Institute, she immediately knew 
what this votive sculpture would say to its, its Mesopotamian ancestors. I'm not gonna spoil it. And so, um, uh, but what I do wanna say is that Jin recorded the narration in one take and it was completely her own words. And, and so, so um, Cody actually in this case serves as a surrogate for Jin, um, who's able to um, more or less embody not only these moments of trauma that happened in the Iraq war for her and the Iraqi detainees, but also across, his, uh, across history. Um, and so I guess I'll leave it at that. You look like them. Or they look like you, laying there with toe tags. The blood had ceased running through their veins. It had formed clots on the cots. The net webbing was full. And so it dripped. It dripped onto the floor. It pulled and it dripped. I'm sorry. Why do you look at me like that? Like, like we're different. Look, I said I was sorry. We're not different. I mean, we are, but we're also the same. Because both of us, all of us, we were created. We were sold and stolen, or stolen and sold to a destination unknown that's not our home. We shouldn't be here. We have stories to tell to our families, our friends, in our own native tongue. We have stories to tell. What's your story? I just keep talking, I just keep talking. <laughs> I guess to myself, because you're not answering. You guys, why are you here? Don't y'all want to go home? Be free? And get y'all out of here. Now's your chance. When I see you, your faces. I see your faces without eyes, and I think of that day. They were broken, but we destroyed them. You are broken, so we keep you locked up, fragile, temperature controlled. Humidity controlled without the chance of human hands touching you except for a quarterly dusting but always gloved. I will always be gloved too. And never again shall blood course through my veins.
Michael, thank you so much for sharing this film with us today and for sharing your work with the museum. My first question has to do with the agency of objects and that theme of surrogacy that you've already invoked with respect both to the action figure and to the votive objects. In the film, um, Special Ops Cody, acting as a surrogate for Jin, encounters ancient artifacts that stir up haunting memories and flashbacks of uh, what are really traumatic and, and difficult to hear experiences of the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. The unavoidable comparisons, though, between the ancient objects and the present-day people of Iraq are the origin of these flashbacks. And I think that one of the most haunting moments um, for me of the film is when that connection is first being made. You look like them, or they look like you, laying there, Cody observes. It sometimes feels that we in the West are more outraged by the destruction of ancient artifacts and cultural heritage than we are by human suffering and the loss of human lives, that we become numb to the human toll or cost of, of our actions around the world. And your work, and this film in particular, focuses our attention squarely on the human toll, but precisely through ancient objects and through a deeply and duly human and historical awareness that pervades all of your works. Can you speak a little bit more about your understanding of the interconnections between ancient objects and contemporary peoples, between the past and the present? Thank you, Sean, for that wonderful question. Um, yes, it's it's something that I, I think about all the time. Um, I think when it comes to when it comes to, you know, that moment of outrage that I talked about before, that like, you know, the 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 looting of the Iraq Museum, for instance, was one of the first moments of pathos that seemed to have opened up um, during the Iraq War, that it didn't matter if you were for the war or against it one could agree that this was not simply a localized Iraqi loss, that this was a loss for all of humanity. Um, some of the earliest uh, iterations of urban laws, you know, that were, were in the cuneiform collections and, and primal scenes of human history. Um, and when that outrage about lost objects did not turn into outrage about lost lives, I, 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 I took note of that. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in that, like I, I it, it outrages me, you know, um, but I also think, you know, a, as somebody who's not a, a psychologist or, or somebody who doesn't totally understand the larger vector of human history and its wholeness, I think that that is one of the things that art allows us to do is to find these indirect vessels for grief. Um, you know, and and that um, that moment where one has to redirect a way back from the art, you know, to what's happening in front of them, is is a moment that I'm interested in making my work from. Um, so I think it's important that you know that we see these artifacts as something that are not locked into a past, but are actually tied to a present. And it's tied to a present in very specific ways, you know, that are concrete that, you know, if we think about the extraction of a lot of these artifacts that have ended up in our museums collections across the global North and in the West, it's happened within the last 200 years. I mean, it's not as though it happened thousands of years ago. So these are relatively new moments of extraction and they're usually you know accompanied through a certain kind of atrocity you know that's visited against the people from whom they're extracted from and also the trauma of being parted from that of saying that something is not worth being kept there you know so that's something that i think about as a contemporary trauma because it happens in the same frame as colonial um adventures and rule into places like West Asia and North Africa. Um, and those kinds of connections, you know, I, I can't disaggregate, I can't disentangle them. You know, when I look at something from the palace of Asher Nasser Pal, you know, I'm not just thinking about it in, you know, the eighth century BC, I'm thinking about, you know, it it happening in the you know that palace being something that was that was disassembled and destroyed a second time in the 1840s when it's excavated. 
Um, so those kinds of those kinds of things really do exist side by side for me. I also think that you know when I look at the people that are in these reliefs or I look at the faces that that are on the votive sculptures, I I think very much about how they do represent you know the the people that live there. I think that it's interesting to point out that when I make these artifacts, many of which come from the Neo Assyrian period, I'm making them you know, uh, going to to supermarkets here in Chicago that are run by Assyrian Iraqi families, you know, who have come from the north of Iraq, who have come from places like Mosul or Shaklawa, Dohuk, you know, and, and you know, they, they understand what my studio assistants and I are making and they see themselves in it. So there's a kind of circular ecology that's also very nice that the that the place that we're sourcing the materials from are coming from the descendants of these very people and i think about how those people aren't safe people who look like that you know like the people that are in these reliefs and are in these vitrines are are not you know that they're they're as unsafe as the artifacts themselves you know especially when they come to the west and so i i find myself you know, thinking about all of that in simul, you know, simultaneity. And then the other thing that that I'll say about about the present is just, you know, the way that these come out of the ground is usually monochromatic. You know, it's like Greek sculpture. In this case, you know, the gypsum that the artifacts are made with. You know, they come out brown and uh, they don't disturb you much. You know, they don't have the paint that was on them in antiquity and the West kind of loves that. But in our reappearances in the studio, the color returns, you know, as if uh, blood is once again running through the veins of the figures. I have to mention that my children really loved watching the Ballad of Special Ops Cody. And I think that that kind of leads into the next um, thread that I want to pick up, which is that you're you're working in materials that are not in any way inaccessible or um, elevated. You're working in in food packaging. These are things that are accessible to everyone, and um, including children. And I find that in contemporary art, you know, children are very rarely thought of. Um, but I do see in your work um, a a humanity that includes children in the audience for art and that takes them seriously as people who might look at and engage with what you're making. And the story that you told about going to the British Museum at the age of 10 and engaging with the lion hunt of Ashurbanipal, I think really makes it clear to me that as a young person, you engaged with art. And so you respect young people's ability to engage with your art. But I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about how you see yourself on this multi-generational continuum and how you think about the materials that you're using and their relevance to, um, to a variety of people there. They, they don't put, put up any barriers to access is what I'm thinking. And I'd like you to talk a little more about that if you could. When I, when I work on projects, I'd like to think of it less as something that can just be easily designated as art, but as something that can enter into the public consciousness as something where somebody isn't even aware of the fact that it's art. You know, when I did the project that essentially was a trigger for all of this work where I reopened my grandfather's company, um, his import export company to import Iraqi dates to the US for the first time in 40 years, you know, that was done not as something where people were told before they came in through the door that this is just an art project. I mean, it was a storefront on Atlantic Avenue uh, in the heart of New York City's Arab community um, and presented itself as being a place that was going to import Iraqi dates. And in fact, it was. Um, you know, whether or not it lands on everybody as an art project, uh, to me is secondary. In fact, I prefer work that can be a bit more insurgent and enter into life and continue, you know, what was being talked about by the artists that I idolize, you know, about like where there's a real blurring between the boundaries of art and life. 
Um, you know, so there's 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 that. I think that um, also I I just think that I I've always had these intergenerational dialogues available to me and my family. And even though I lost my grandparents at an early age and made enough of an impact. And my mother was included in that trajectory, you know? So her always being present when my grandparents were part of that conversation made it so that those conversations could continue so that that appreciation could continue. And one of the things that I do love about you know the the vanguard and about um, about, about contemporary art and and the birth of so much of its thinking. You know, with things like the ready made, for instance. I mean, it's it is about dislodging, you know, the work of art or the work of culture from a moment of preciousness and exclusivity and scarcity. Um, and it pushes against what we know is a kind of market economy, you know, that tends to define our lives. So the idea that something could simply be replicated, you know, um, and mimicked, you know, if you like that thing, is something that I adore. You know, um, I think about that a lot. I also think it's one of the reasons why I insist on having multiple hands in my studio is that these are impossible tasks for me to take on on my own. And I love the fact that these works that were very much about like these, these cities, you know, from a long time ago, you know, it was a city that actually had to make all these objects in the first place. And there's a reflective moment in the way that they're made here. So it takes away the preciousness of this being one person's hand. In fact, all of those votive sculptures were made out of different hands. And these, you know, these, these reliefs behind me were made by different hands, you know? So I, I think for me that that's an important, that was an important moment for me when I, when, when I started to kind of, kind of understand art history um, through the lens of modernity, you know, was the fact that, that when, when my mother told me about Warhol saying that everybody could be an artist, you know, or Yoko Ono saying the same thing, it didn't land on me as something that was just being said. You know, it meant that it was true. Um, and I try to hold that out as much as I can in the way that I operate in the world, in the way that I engage my audiences, which is that like, you know, this is, this is possible, you know, that these kinds of, of materials that I'm using point to an urgency but they also point to something that everybody has, um, you know, a kind of experience with when I think about the Iraqi community or I think about the Arab American community. So I have one last question and then we'll turn to our audience to continue the Q&A. For those of you at home, if you have any burning questions, now would be a good time to enter those into the Q&A feature on your screen. Your questions will be visible only to those of us on screen and not to your fellow attendees. Michael, I want to pick up on something you just mentioned about uh, trying to create the museum that's welcoming to everyone, um, which is work that I think we're all uh, pressingly engaged in, um, artists, uh, curators alike. Um, Special Ops Cody and Works from the Invisible Enemy Project have already fostered some really wonderful and critical conversations in our galleries about the relationship and responsibilities of America and Americans towards Iraqi cultural heritage. Curators and museums are uh, responsible for caring for that cultural heritage, but should this caretaking be the sole responsibility of these institutions? Can you envision a way to bring in communities that are not currently given privileged access to Iraqi cultural heritage? And as we go about this business of caring for the past, what can we do to be shaping a, a better present? Well, thank you for that, that inspiring and courageous question. Um, it's something that I think about a lot. Um, you know, first off, you know, I do think that there are exemplary organizations like the Narin network that Dr. Eleanor Robeson um, is involved with um, uh, through 
uh, University College of London, and um, and also a lot of the relationships that have been built up through the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago in engaging with fellow archaeologists and academics at places like the National Museum of Iraq and throughout the, the country. Um, you know, for me, I think that museums should be willing to listen to publics that are outside of their direct publics. Um, I think that when it comes to these objects that are in collections, you know, that we need to first kind of understand why the museum is there in the first place. And one of the things that I've recognized in my own life with my own sweet and sour relationship to museums, um, thinking back to that experience in the British Museum and being so grateful that I was in front of the lion hunt of Asher Bani Pal, but also feeling the sting, you know, that it was not where it came from. Um, you know, I think that we need to work to make what we consider to be encyclopedic museums, something that operate on a relationship of mutuality um, and reciprocity. And that is something that I think, you know, needs to be in that conversation about, you know, what it means to have a, a, a collection that engages with accountability and questions around restitution and questions around decolonization. I wanna be led in those conversations by people who are from those places or exist in those places. Um, I want, you know, to, to not have the conversation happening uh, from the West and from the global North and directed elsewhere. I mean, that's very much the conversation about, uh, that, that's how the conversation around conservation has happened. You know, so I would encourage those voices to be brought in um, first and foremost. Um, I also believe that when we talk about decolonization and restitution and repatriation, that, that we need to be careful that those conversations don't become as easy as apology. Um, apology is often, you know, offered with good intentions, but the way that it operates is usually to unburden the person who's delivering the apology rather than to truly heal the person who's receiving it. And what I like to think of beyond the apology, you know, is uh, rest, restoration. You know, like when we talk about restorative justice, I think about the way in which that as a practice is, is truly um, helpful because it's ongoing work. It doesn't necessarily always, it doesn't necessarily end, um, you know, people have to commit to it. And, and so I think about restoration also being part of that conversation in museums, that every museum that I know of has a restorer. Um, and if we can engage in a kind of restoration of the object, as opposed to just something that's simple, you know, where things need to be given back, they should be given back, but there should be a dialogue that follows, that continues, because that relationship is forever. You know, it's been taken from one place, brought to another, and, uh, you know, the issue doesn't end with some kind of polite return, to use that word again. Um, so, you know, I think that we need, we need to, um, to understand that there isn't that that there probably will be directives that are developed, you know, as a kind of best practices, but I think we need to look at the human relationships also beyond those best practices. I think that's one of the ways in which museums can actually make people feel welcome. Because if I think about myself being one of those bodies that's been displaced from one of those places, I never truly feel like those objects are actually, you know, there for me. <laughs> um, 
and you know but i also um think that we need to bring a little bit more into the foreground those conversations that i know a lot of museums are having with their colleagues in places like iraq and in syria like that should be some of the front of the house um uh explanation as opposed to it just existing as some kind of program i love the idea of an encyclopedic museum uh, that comes from a, a, a real mutual curiosity about one another, you know, but we also have to face it that the encyclopedic museum begins as a kind of imperial entity. And most encyclopedic museums are located in the global north and in the west. Well, Welcome everyone. And um, we are having a, a little bit of technical difficulties. Michael was planning to join us uh, live uh, momentarily and he may still, um, but I do wanna take the opportunity uh, to thank Sarah and Michael uh, in absentia um, for joining us uh, and taking part in such an inspiring and thought provoking conversation. But I also want our audiences at home to feel welcome to that conversation. And I'm sure that their curiosity has been ignited tonight by the work that we've shared here and the discussion that we've had. Um, we're getting a steady stream of, of great questions and we won't get to them all, but hopefully uh, Sarah and I uh, can, can field a few of them um, and, and uh, really welcome that feedback. I do wanna note though, um, that what you've just viewed is a condensed version of a really thought-provoking and wide-ranging conversation that Sarah and I were able to record with Michael uh, last week. And so, um, oh, Michael has joined us. Hello, Sorry Michael. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, that's terrific. Um, I, was asking, I, I somehow clicked the wrong link. No, Sarah, Sarah had a little trouble as well. So welcome to the conversation again, and and thank you for joining us. Um, do you like my wardrobe change? I, I do, I do. Um, well, uh, we have a number of really awesome questions coming in, so uh, let's just hop to them. But Michael, know that you were just thanked again, and um, we're really grateful that you're here with us tonight. Um, so actually, there's a really interesting question um, uh, from a conservator in the audience who asks about the eyes and the votive statues and the materials used to make them, particularly the vivid blues. And um, she notes that as a conservator, she appreciates the way that you work with original artifacts in a way that makes them so current and wonders if you could speak a little bit more to that. Um, Sarah, I also know that there are some comments that didn't make it into the cut this evening that you had about the ancient colors as well. So this is a really rich topic. Michael, Sorry, so like is the question along the lines of what was used in antiquity or, or, or how we're using color? Uh, my studio and I in these these uh, iterations that we're making. I think it. I think it's primarily about the way that you're using color in a way that's both respectful of antiquity, but also deeply current and and modern. Yeah. Well, I um I I love these questions about the color because you know in our conversation we talked about how you know when these come out of the the ground they're always monochrome. Um, and so uh, having a kind of return to the polychromy is um, is really, you know, a lot like the the life returning to to the work. Um, actually, it was Bowden's studies on the uh, the the panels from the Northwest Palace of Nimrud. Uh, the, the color schemes that they that was discovered, you know, to have been probable uh, during the time of, of Ashur Nasser Pal's reign that um, really informed my studio's um, commencement of the work. When, when, when we first made Room N, it really abided by the yellow background um, that was suggested and, and of course the skin tones and then the, you know, the, the real sort of um, rhythm of the blues and the reds and then of course the greens that appear in the tree of life panels so we we followed that um for the first room that we built um and then we learned that much like the buddha's abamyan um that the panels been colored 
differently, you know, over time, that there were decisions that were made that were purely um, on the kind of whim of, uh, of, of the people using the room of, of the, the royal family. And so that gave us a little bit of license to depart from it a little bit, you know, and, um, but we do still maintain, you know, a consistency with say the skin tone in the, um, in, in the, um, in the reliefs, but, um, you know, we, we, we tend to incorporate as many theories as possible, you know, but it also allows for us to, um, to, like I said, depart a little bit, to have a little bit of agency as, um, as these, uh, as a, a new team, you know, that's, that's making these ghosts reappear. Um, when it, when it comes to, when it comes to the actual, you know, materials, um, we have all manner of uh, a kind of indexing system. I guess I can take you on a little tour of the studio as part of this, right? It's part of the fun, I guess, of doing this. Hopefully the internet connection will hold up. But if I go into, you know, the second part of the studio, um, I can We've taken, you know, all the different tea and all the different um, all the different pieces of the newspapers, and we've we've put them into different containers, you know, so that we can we can separate out the colors as we need it. Um, so it really is, you know, like part of our the same way that one would go shopping based on the recipes that they want to make during the week. We sometimes go shopping based on the kinds of uh, colors we want to build these these artifacts and reliefs from. So it's um, it's a new kind of a recipe in a way. But um, but we we also do try to, you know, to do things like, you know, react to the fact that like if an if an artifact is described as having bitumen eyes, um, you know, to do something that approximates that, but to also feel like we each have some individual license to to put in, you know, some of our own flourishes as well. You know, one of the things actually that I, I find really interesting, you, refer, you referred to it as a new kind of recipe. Um, and I remember being in your in your studio and you um, I, I'm being surprised or or at the care that you've given to choosing these colors, but not only choosing them, but pres preserving them, that you're treating all of the colors so that the, the colors won't fade over time, unlike the reliefs themselves in a way. I, th I think that's very interesting. Um, and actually might be a good segue, Sarah, if you have anything that you'd like to, to comment about the colors from your work. Oh, you know, it's such a joy to hear Michael talk about colors because it, it is so, it's like seeing something, an object that I know so well turn um, at a different angle. And then it suddenly looks strange and interesting in all new ways. And um, I don't wanna add that much, but I, I do want to, say that all of the vivid color, the idea of vivid color on the relief, um, and I said this in the extended version of our conversation, it, it is completely um, historically accurate and that recent research has shown that the inscriptions, the letters were inlaid in a pigment called Egyptian blue, which is almost a you know, neon turquoise blue. Um, and I, I think the question about the eyes Maybe the person who asked it was curious about the material. So I'll just say that's, you know, a little tidbit of information. Anytime you see that vivid blue, you know that it's lapis lazuli, which um, only comes in outside of the Americas, only comes from um, the Badakhshan Valley in Northeastern Afghanistan. So when you see it in Southern Iraq in the third millennium BC, you know that they were bringing it there from Northeastern Afghanistan at that early date, which is really something spectacular to consider. Uh, there's a, a number of re really good questions and we're not gonna get to all of them, but I think we can maybe get to at least two more. Um, one question uh, notes that your Invisible Enemy project um, began in the wake of the 2003 looting of the, of the Baghdad Museum of the Iraq National Museum um, in the wake of the US invasion. Um, 
but it's continued to evolve in light of damage and destruction um, at the hands of ISIS in more recent years. And I um, wonder if you could talk a little bit about the evolution of that project in the wake of more recent events. Uh, you're muted, sorry. Still muted. How are we doing? Okay. Can you We're hear great. me? All right. <laughs> um, it was already a project that was likely going to outlive me and my studio by just focusing on the 8,000 artifacts that remain at large after the looting of the museum. Um, but it's unfortunately grown to include the archaeological sites of places like Nimrud and Nineveh and also the Mosul Museum. Um, and uh, there's also a branch of the project that deals with the object types that have been destroyed or threatened in Syria, um, because it's essentially a continuation of the same war. Um, and I, 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 the way that the project has progress ha has actually evolved, you know, is seen, you know, through the the way that certain certain things have, have be, become, you know, part of the work, like making the colossal uh, Lamassu that was on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square in London um, was directly uh, referencing that it's 2015 destruction at the hands of ISIS. And then of course the reliefs that you see behind me here that my studio and I are reappearing are, are from that same period of time uh, where Nimrud is dynamited in, um, in 2015. So um, it's, it's unfortunately grown. I mean, it's an ongoing project and that, that means that it also uh, grows to include the way in which that narrative spreads. And, and I think it's important to note that um, you know, one of the things that really gave me clarity on what, what I was doing with this work was that visit to the Pergamon Museum and understanding that the begins or ends with ISIS in 2015 or with the, the looting of the museum in 2003, it's, it's something that's been going on, um, you know, throughout history. And uh, if we think about it, its first moments in the modern era, we're looking at it in the middle of the 1800s when people like Laird um, descend on those sites. Um, there's also a material evolution of the work where I'm not an Arabic reader, um, but as the project has progressed, um, for instance, the English Arabic newspapers that are included in the work, which are often directed towards newly arrived immigrants from places like Iraq or Syria in those supermarkets where, where you get the food and everything else. Um, if you look at some of the artifacts that were made in the early part of the project in 2006, 2007, there's a lot of articles on there that are about um, the surge, you know, and about the insurgency. Um, for artifacts that my team and I made in 2013, you start to see, you know, the, the most prominent stor stories are about Syria. In 2015, it's about ISIS and it's about Mosul and it's about Raqqa, you know. Um, and then in 2017, you start to see a lot about Trump and about the Muslim ban. You know, so there's these, these other layers of the work that, um, that I'm not always privy to, but I know they're there. Um, and I've had conversations with people who um, are fluent and come from places like, like Iraq, um, where they've actually noticed the juxtaposition of something like an article about the Muslim ban and, um, it, you know, next to it, collage next to it is uh, an advertisement for a lawyer who can help with asylum seeker cases. Um, you know, so there's there's interesting elements to that. I just felt like that connected a little bit to the question that was asked and yeah. Yeah, I think that's fascinating to think that there's a whole history being tracked sort of 
um, or embedded in the work through the material itself. Um, that's and and almost un, both unavoidably and perhaps in some ways unintentionally, um, but um, being incorporated there. That's that's really incredible. Um, perhaps we have time for one more question. Um, and there is what I think a really interesting question that goes to this idea of surrogacy in, in your work. Um, and the question is one that I certainly don't know the answer to, but I would welcome your thoughts on it. It's, uh, it's about whether we might consider our, our deployed troops as surrogates themselves. And uh, the questioner asks, as someone who has thought a lot about this paradigm, whether you have more thoughts about it. We're, we're thinking about, um, about troops as a surrogate for, for America. Is that sort of what thinking about troops as a surrogate? That's what my mind goes to immediately. Yeah. 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 Well, you see, well, that's, yeah, that's one of the tragedies, I think. Um, it's a very interesting question. I mean, if, if I'm thinking it through on the spot, I'm, I'm thinking about the, you know, the way in which um, my conversations and my ongoing dialogue with US veterans is often, you know, talking about the way that they made uh, decisions that involve themselves as individuals when they've decided to come back and to speak truth to power and to devote, devote themselves to pacifism and anti-militarism. Um, and, and I think that when they're asked to be a surrogate for power, you know, and to actually, you know, present that vector of power violently, um, you know, this is, this is one of the real, this is one of the real problems. You know, and I think that that's what some of the some of the residual that we deal with when we talk about you know them being welcomed back into society. Like, how do you do that with somebody? How do you go through that kind of transformation that somebody's had to make? You know, of uh, in in their minds and in their hearts. You know, to suddenly subsume themselves and to wear a uniform and to essentially. Um, you know, become a surrogate for American power. And, and that's where, you know, again, a lot of the PTSD comes in. That is where the moral injury begins, you know, the way in which they lose themselves in the desensitization process that often happens with bayonet training. Like nobody really uses bayonets anymore, but they still have bayonet training in the army so that, um, uh, at the very beginning of training, a soldier will will be able to feel what it's like for a blade, you know, that's attached to a gun to go into, you know, a surrogate for a body, right? They they charge these silicone, um, uh, um, you know, dummies, and and so you know, as I've thought about, as I've thought about like Jin's role her courageous role in this film, you know, she speaks about her experience, but unfortunately her experience is shared by so many, you know, and it's never, it's never to be rendered as a one-to-one -one ratio for, you know, the horrific experience of the Iraqis. Um, but this is what it means essentially to bring the war home. It's not just about bringing the troops home. Um, so the troops themselves, I think, also become a surrogate for something that we, as civilians, you know, think we can never feel, that we can never know. But it's important for us to listen. You know, this is one of the reasons why it's really unfortunate that they didn't have, you know, a kind of, um, you know, the, something that was, uh, that was done to be accommodated by the state, you know, for, for there to be testimonies offered by returning soldiers, um, you know, because I think it would have helped the American public to understand exactly what kind of wounds people were coming back with, you know, what, what kind of fragments that we couldn't see. And, um, and whenever we, 
we position ourselves outside of, of that experience and say that we can never know, you isolate somebody in their pain. You know, you isolate somebody in that experience that was done essentially on our behalf, whether we liked it or not. And so I think that in a way, the surrogacy really is, is about knowing what it means to be an American at a time of war when we're so comfortably removed from the battlefield and to then listen to those people who come back from it and are able to tell you the truth about what happened in a way that it couldn't be done with embedded reporters. Michael, I, I wanna thank you for sharing your work with us, um, which I think does help make us uncomfortable in very productive ways, help remove some of the isolation through a really rich historical and present contextualization and well, as, as, as well. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time this evening. I wish we could continue the conversation and, and I'm sure we will in, in other venues and in other ways. But uh, Michael and Sarah both, uh, on behalf of all of us here at the museum and at Bowdoin, I wanna thank you both for joining us this evening and for sharing with us uh, for what has been a, an incredibly rich program. I know that our conversation tonight uh, will provide much for us to reflect on and inspire us as we share in this important work of caring not only for the reliefs, but for the communities that are still so vitally connected to them and of building a museum, a world and a future that is welcoming to all. So thank you to both of you. And thank you also to our audience for joining us tonight and participating. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Sarah. And Sarah, it's so great to have met you through this and to know that story about the Egyptian blue. Um, you know, I, the, I'm gonna create all kinds of problems here at the studio, insisting that from now on the cuneiform be rendered in Egyptian blue, but, um, but thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much to Sean for inviting me to join your conversation, to Michael for, your generosity in sharing your work with us and um, and your ideas and you know I I hope that everyone will check out the extended conversation um, and thank you all for being here today. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Much. Yes, as a final word to our audience, we will share an extended version of our conversation um, in, in the next week. So stay tuned for more. <laughs>